when somebody else is hurting. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, I'm going to give you some stuff this morning that's, uh, that's some powerful stuff. Very powerful. I'm, all of it is, for that matter. But I'm going to try to put a few things together for you today to give you an indication of, what's, uh, of what we're dealing with here in the last days. Now, turn over here to the book of Daniel and uh, make it chapter number uh, 11 and verse number 38. Daniel eleven thirty-eight. 38. Now, the Lord Jesus himself made direct reference to Daniel. He made direct reference to this book and he made reference to the fact that Daniel was a prophet. Amen. So in Daniel chapter number 11 and verse number 38, did you know that in most of the liberal Bible colleges and universities in this country and around the world, Graf Wellhausen, German higher criticism, all that junk, that uh, most of them do not believe that the book of Daniel is inspired? They don't believe it. They don't believe it. And that's what they teach the young men when they go off to these schools. And then when they walk out of there, they go into the Bible colleges, a lot of them, believing the Bible. Then when they come out, they're infidels. After three or four or five years of so-called education, higher learning, they've destroyed their faith in the Word of God. So I'm going to take what the Lord Jesus said. He said Daniel was a prophet. That's good enough for me. Amen. Daniel chapter number 11 and verse number 38. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, a God whom his fathers knew not till he, till he honor with gold. Knew not, <clears throat> uh, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. So we have a reference here to the Antichrist who will honor the God of forces. Now I've never seen any of these, um, what do they call them? Uh, uh, they just had... Uh, the guy that's got the black uh, helmet that looks like a Nazi helmet. Uh, Star Wars. I've never seen any of the Star Wars uh, uh, movies, but they make reference to the God of forces in there. It's about the force, the force, the force. And that's what they're talking about. They're talking about an impersonal force. This is what pantheism is about. Pantheism is about an impersonal force, a life force. And if you remember last week, I went into detail about that. I'll pick it up again in, uh, in the future. But I want you to keep in mind that when they say God and I say God, that we're talking about two entirely different things, Amen. absolutely different things. It's called semantics. It is, the, it is the play of words. And so when I say the Lord God Almighty, I'm talking about a personal creator, almighty, eternal absolute being that resides and exists in his own element that he does not need creation to exist for he is the creator and he is from everlasting to everlasting. He's the almighty and he manifested himself 2,000 years ago on this earth. He became a man and he walked amongst us and that's the God man, our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I believe. And I believe that he's the only savior of mankind. But when they talk about God, they're talking about an impersonal life force. Evolutionists believe the same thing, although they would, not, uh, they would never uh, uh, probably confess that to you because they want to remain scientific. And their science, of course, is voodoo science. Anybody that believes in evolution, you've got a problem, big one. But anyway... The God of forces here in the book of Daniel makes a reference, therefore, to an impersonal being. An imp not, not being, an impersonal, uh, <laughs> it's hard to put it in words, influence, uh, something uh, that, they call the, uh, that they call the life force, but it's not a person. Now, a few months back in July, Pope Francis uh, held a... Uh, a ceremony in front of the obelisk in Washington, D.C. And the obelisk, from what I've told you before, is 666 feet long. And they had at that also a Ouroboros. This Ouroboros, this sign of the Ouroboros was prominent everywhere. 
Now, most folks don't know what an Ouroboros is, but that's my responsibility up here is to teach that, to tell you what's going on when it comes to this kind of thing. Because my people, he said in Hosea, are destroyed for lack of knowledge. First of all, an Ouroboros is a snake, a snake. An Ouroboros is found in a circle, a circle. And being found in a circle, therefore, the head will contact the tail. And the Ouroboros is where the head is eating the tail, all right? That has great occultic significance. And this is why that you need to listen carefully to what I'm going to say, because I'm going to bring you down to what's happening in the near future in Jerusalem, the old city. They have a meeting planned. And this present pope, Pope Francis, has been the most active ecumenical pope that Rome has ever had, I suppose. And remember, don't ever forget that this Pope Francis is a Jesuit. And don't ever forget that the Jesuits are exactly like the Muslims. They can use what's called taqiyya. A Muslim can lie to you, and he can lie to you to, to further his goal, his agenda, whatever he intends to do. And then he can turn around to his God, which is not my God. He can turn around to his God and he can get forgiveness for it because it was done in the uh, service of Allah. So the, the, the Jesuits are the, uh, are the clandestine, black-robed uh, uh, movers and shakers of the agenda of the Vatican. I'm going to read a few things to you. Picked up here just a few days ago. In uh, September the 4th through the 23rd, 2016, that's coming up soon, in the old city of Jerusalem, leaders from the Roman Catholic, Jewish, and Muslim faiths will gather for one of the largest interface services, and it is a focus on ecumenicism. What's that mean? That means the coming together of all religions. They intend to do away with the category of religion to ignore the differences that separate us. They want to find the common ground that brings us together. Part one will be September the 5th through the 11th. Jews, Muslim Christians are in what's called a passion for Jerusalem. Now, you know that if you've read your Bible, you'll know that according to the book of, of uh, Revelation, Jerusalem is spiritually what? What does it say? It certainly does. They will be dissolving boundaries and coming together in worship to the same God. All right. In order to come together to worship the same God, then you must define and identify that God. That's important. Define and identify that God. I worship one God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way I can worship the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is through the Lord Jesus Christ. So they come together to worship the same God. Part two, September the 12th through the 23rd, is a consecration. This is in the old city of Jerusalem. This is just a few days from now. The, the 12th of September through the 23rd of September, they're going to call it Makudashet. Makudashet. This is an 11 day consecration. This is a ceremony that is declaring something to be holy. And this is coming, coming soon. Christian, Muslim, and Jew declaring the new God to be holy. So now we're going to have a definition of a new God. Folks, this is important. Coming up in just a few days in Jerusalem. Pope Francis has worked so hard in 2016 to achieve this ecumenical movement. The Vatican is the chief proponent of this ecumenical movement around the world. For three years, Pope Francis has worked tirelessly for a new world religion where all religions are brought together in one. He's opened... Uh, he's openly condemned evangelical Christianity and a personal relationship with Christ. He has openly condemned that. Now digest that. 
Every one of you in this house, if you believe in the new birth and believe that you have been born again and you have a personal relationship with Christ, he condemned you. And so therefore, what do you think about all these Protestant pastors that are jumping on the bandwagon with him? They condemn you too. He has openly warned that the belief is dangerous. He has compared the spread of gospel, the gospel of Christ, through evangelical Christianity to jihadism. Now think about that. You know, what is a jihadist? They're the ones who drown the girls in cages, cut the heads off of the Christians, Coptic Christians. They lined all those men up. They drop them into vats of acid. They, they burn people alive and every other uh, imaginable heinous thing that they can work on a humanity. These are some of the vilest creatures that ever walked the face of this earth. And he compares the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to get people born again as jihadism. Now digest that. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Does this man speak for you? Think about it. Does he speak for you? And he, uh, he, of course, has taken this stand because he wants to project a Christianity that embraces all religions. This is why he condemns this. Because if he, if he embraced the idea that you're preaching the gospel and the only way to be saved is through the Lord Jesus Christ and that you've got to be born again to go to heaven, if he openly embraces that, he's going to exclude the Jew and he's going to exclude the Muslim. So he must, he must project a, a, a all-embracing Christianity to the Muslim and to the Jew where they all have they all have things in common that can bring them together. Do you understand that the preaching of the cross of Christ is to them that foolish, that them, them that perish foolishness? That Christ is a divider? That you're either for him or against him? And that when you preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you, are the, you either accept him or you reject him? There's no middle ground. There's no gray areas in it. That's, there's, you know, but, but, but religion, religion is not about Christ. Religion is about this impersonal spirit. Now watch this thing. Watch this thing. His efforts in 2016 have been mind-boggling. For the first time, he held a meeting with Patriarch, Patriarch Kirill of Russia. Who is that? That's the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. And this is uh, 1054 was the Great Schism. 1054 is when they separated over a number of issues. And he's reaching out to these Orthodox, and he's trying to bring them back into the fold. That's what that's about. And after he had this meeting with Kirill, he went, Kirill went to the Antarctica to perform a weird consecration ceremony down there that, uh, that uh, related to the whole continent of Antarctica. There's a lot about Antarctica. If you'll remember, I told you how that Admiral Richard Byrd led a, led, a, led a naval expedition into Antarctica in about 1947, somewhere in there. And it was called Operation High Jump. And if we are to believe what these officers and men said, they saw flying discs in the sky. They saw all kinds of weird stuff in Antarctica taking place. And, of course, Admiral Byrd wrote a diary. It's uh, his Admiral Byrd's diary. And in his diary, he says that he was... Uh, he was uh, literally, uh, I guess, just taken over by a power far greater than himself and that he saw, uh, he saw a world that he didn't even know existed and he communicated with these people and they told him how that, that, in, in, that in not too distant future that they are going to have to directly intervene in the affairs of mankind before he destroys himself. Richard Byrd said if his diary is to be believed, that there are vessels that he saw them that could move with a blinding speed from pole to pole. And it had, and it had him really upset because he, the way he saw it, being a naval commander, being a commander, an admiral, he knew that if we had to engage in war with that kind of power, we'd be in trouble. So because of what Admiral Byrd said in his diary, the diary itself comes under 
enormous attack. And it's supposed to be a forgery like the protocols of Zion all this and that. I'm, I don't have the resources to tell you whether it's a forgery or not. But I do know I've, I've, I've done a pretty good bit of research into it, and that's what I come up with. And if it is to be believed and, if it, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, what he says is true and he, he's the author of it, there's some heavy-duty stuff going on out there, right? Absolutely. So why did he go to Antarctica? Why, do, why does the leader, why does the leader of the Orthodox Church in Russia, Russia, by far, folks, by far, by far, the largest nation on earth, not in numbers, but in size. It spans eight time zones. It's huge. And it is a powerful nuclear force. Powerful, powerful nuclear force. Does the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church have any pull with Vladimir Putin? Vladimir Putin says that he's a Christian. I've watched videos on YouTube where Vladimir Putin has visited Jerusalem. He has, uh, he has constantly visiting these, 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 these Russian Orthodox churches, and he's in there worshiping with them. He's, he's going through all of the, of, of the movements of the Russian Orthodox, and Vladimir Putin says he's a Christian. And that the, Russian, that, the, that, the, that the Russian government is openly embracing this. So, so what's going on? Could it be that we've got some diplomacy going on here? Could it be that there's, you know, there's a reason why he's trying to pull Kirill into the fold? Could be. Here's something I want you to think about for just a moment. Albert Pike said there would be three world wars. He said that in the 1800s. You remember Albert Pike? All right. One of the issues in that third world war is the Muslim. And the introduction of the Muslim into the Western European culture, that, you know, Western European, Europe, America, the rest of it, has presented chaos. Remember that the, that the basic foundation for pantheism and the new world order is to bring order out of chaos, right? order out of chaos. Amen. And believe me, there is chaos in Europe, no question about it. And there's chaos all over this place, and the chaos is a direct product of bringing all of these Muslims into mixing them into the culture instead of letting, and they don't assimilate. In other words, they don't become part of the culture they move into. No, 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 they, they, they just, they, they stay together in their own place, and they want to impose Sharia law and they want to live under their law and their own air. They want to become sovereign. They want to be a sovereign people within a sovereign nation. But anyway, here's what's, this is what's important. This is important. This is, this is the kind of thing to make you think. Albert Pike uh, is talking about this third world war and dealing with the Muslims. Uh, he knew, he knew that the Muslim is uncontrollable. This is why. There is no such thing in any Muslim country of democracy. How many know that? Amen. How many has ever been to the First Baptist Church in Saudi Arabia? <laughs> Doesn't exist. But you don't hear about that on CBS, NBC, and ABC because they want to present a different Muslim to this nation. They think that the masses in America are so stupid and ignorant that they're going to believe everything that they get from they're going to be spoon-fed by CBS, NBC, and ABC. But the bottom line is go to Dearborn, Michigan, and you'll find out how it works in this country. Dearborn, Michigan. Just go check it out. All right? But ask yourself this question. Name me one Arab country that has nuclear capability. Just one. Pardon? Apart from Pakistan is a product of India. Cut away from India. Pakistan is pretty well contained. Pakistan. But apart from that, Notice what nation that they have come against to stop them from getting a nuclear weapon. What nation is that? That's Iran, Persia, the old Persia. Why? Why, why? why do they want to stop them? They want to stop them because they want to be able to control them and destroy them. And that's exactly what they intend to do, is to destroy them once they have used them to create the chaos that they want in the world so they can rise to power. They're coming soon to take over this world militarily, economically, but let me show you the religious arm of it. 
This is what's going to happen in Jerusalem in just a few days. Listen carefully. Francis has reached out to the patriarch of Turkey and he has, uh, he and the, and, the, uh, and the patriarch of Turkey have voiced support for migrants, for more migrants to enter Europe. More of them. Why would they want more migrants into Europe? More chaos. Would you ask the Pope, dear Pope, how many have you brought into the Vatican? <laughs> I'll bet you the Swiss guard is still standing over there, and I'll bet you there are none. You know why? The Vatican is a sovereign country that prints its own money, and it came from what was called the Papal States. And the Papal States existed for well over a thousand years. So, no, you know, you know, it's just like Angela Merkel over there in Germany. You can bring all these in, you know, and you're going to have to assimilate. You're going to have to accept them. This, that, this, that, this, that. But she didn't. They live up here. They're the elite. They live at the top. But they expect you to do that. And the reason for this is because they know it's going to create chaos. In May, Francis met with uh, 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 Al Arn, Al al Asor of Egypt, the head of the Sunni Islam. In January, he met with, uh, he visited the Roman major, the, the major synagogue in Rome. In June, Francis outreached to the Armenians. And in July, he visited Poland. And to all the young people there in Poland, he preached, we are looking for a new humanity. In August, Francis met a huge interactive with the Lutherans in the U.S. A document was created a declaration of the way. And now the Lutheran church apparently is going to be brought right into the Roman Catholic church. 3.7 million Lutherans are now absorbed into the new world religion. And I told you that in July, Francis was the driving force behind a ceremony in the U.S. called Together. Now listen carefully what I'm going to tell you about this. Together. This was organized to bring Christians together in front of a 6,660 feet uh, or inch rather obelisk on the, on the, I don't want to use this word, but how many of you know what an obelisk is? Because a lot of times I don't want to embarrass anybody. How many of you don't know what an obelisk is? All right. Uh, look at Osiris. Do a Google search when you get home this afternoon and, and pull up Osiris. Uh... It's kind of hard to know how to, how to say this. Do a Google search of Osiris. Go back into the ancient uh, depictions of Osiris and you'll discover that what you see that for, that's given for public consumption in America in the textbooks and all of that is a partial representation of Osiris. That Osiris is depicted in Egyptian art and in Egyptian, uh, in the culture, with far more detail about far more things than you see here, okay? Is that enough? You all following me now? All right. The legend of Osiris is that he died and that he's coming back. And that when he comes back, he's going to be resurrected from the dead. The idea is that Osiris, when he rises from the dead, is going to bring in a new age. He's going to bring in a new order. And the old age is out and the new age is in. And so therefore, this ceremony was designed with the Ouroboros. Now watch carefully. It was designed with the Ouroboros to bring Osiris back from the dead. There stands his obelisk in front of it. To bring him back up from the dead, his spirit, that will inhabit somebody on this earth who becomes Osiris incarnate, in other words, the Antichrist on this earth. And the way they're going to do it is through the Ouroboros. Now, I'll explain that, preacher. All right. The Ouroboros is a circle like this. It's a snake eating its tail. Note carefully. When I go down in the circle, I'm going down. But once I reach the bottom, I start coming back up again, don't I? Then I rise to the top of heaven, and then I go back down again. The idea with the Ouroboros is that you start and go down into chaos, down into chaos. Then you rise on the other side, 
back up into great order or, or restoration or creation. The Hindu Trinity, and this is important, the Hindu Trinity is Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, right? What statue is over there in front of CERN? Shiva. Shiva, one of Shiva's wives, by the way, is Kali. Do you remember the image projected on that uh, Empire State? One of his wives is Kali. Kali is the murderous destroyer who has a bloodlust that must be fed. But let's get back to the Trinity. Brahma is the creator. Vishnu is the sustainer. And, and uh, Shiva is the destroyer. All three of them working in unison create what pantheism believes. In order to understand the full reality of the existence you're in, you have good and you have bad. Remember what I told you last week? You've got the good, you've got the bad. In order for you to be complete, you have to embrace the good, but you have to embrace the bad. Remember what I told you about Albert Pike? Albert Pike said, Lucifer is God. Remember? That's the good side. But he said, sad to say, Adonai is also God. That's the bad side. Adonai is the God of the Old Testament. How many are following me now? I know I'm, I'm dumping a lot of stuff on you, but I'll give it to you, different pieces here and there. And after a while, this stuff will start coming together for you. You must have the good and you must have the bad. All right? The Ouroboros represents the good and the bad. Because the Ouroboros goes down in the circle, then it comes back up out of the circle, and then it connects with itself. In plainer words, what was happening there and together when the Pope Francis stood in front of that obelisk of Osiris is that we will destroy whatever must be destroyed in order to bring about a new age and a new world religion on this earth. And we're going to do this right in front of the spirit of Osiris, this obelisk. And when he comes up, when he comes up from down here, he will come up and he will lead this world into a new age of religious understanding and, 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 and joy and peace and all the things that they say they want. But the only way they say they'll ever have them is for all the religions of the world to come together. And that's exactly what the United Nations is about right now. Well, that religious in initiative up there is bringing the religions of the world together. This is why you, as an evangelical or a born-again believer, you are demonized, you are cursed by this new world religion. There is nowhere for you in this new world, new age religion. Amen. Nowhere. Amen. Nowhere. And rightfully so. Because the prince of this world cometh and hath no part in me. So you have destruction and you have creation. You have creation and destruction, but they both make up the same essence or the same, uh, 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 what's a good word for it? The same, the same uh, experience. You have to have both. This is why you've got a yin and a yang. The yin is the female, the dark side. The yang is the male, the good side. Ladies, I didn't create that. <laughs> I'm not original with it. But according to them, that's what it is. You've got the circle, and the yang is the male, and the yin is the female. This is why you have an androgynous creature like Baphomet that is both male and female. This is why you have sodomy and transgenderism rising up to the top now because they are brainwashing Americans into accepting a feminine part to male. In plain words, male and female both together. They are confusing the gender issue. Why are they doing that? Because their God is both male and female. But here's the key. And ladies, you'll appreciate this now. Since I put you down with yin yang, you'll like this part. In order to get back to this essence, this oneness, coming back up to the top. Let's see, which way was I going? This way. I'm having to make a difference. When you get back up to the top, when you climb up to that Godhood, through enlightenment, through the third eye chakra, when you begin to see what nobody else can see, the only way that you can get back up there is through the goddess, the feminine part. The goddess will bring you back to Lucifer, the light giver, 
the one of the emanation from that noose or that mind or that great mind. Now, how many are following what I've said to you? This is why you've got the feminine principle. This is why you've got, you've got people in the Methodist churches and some of these other Protestant denominations that are having workshops on the feminine. The feminine. It wasn't that long ago that one within a stone's throw of us was having, was having meetings talking about Carl Jung, J-U-N-G. Do you know who he was? Carl Jung. His name's pronounced Jung. It's J-U-N-G. He was a man that was driven by demons all of his life. But he was also one, like all the rest of them, like every last one of them, that was involved in the sacred feminine. The sacred feminine. The sacred feminine. The goddess. The goddess, therefore, is what you need to plug into if you want to be brought up into this, into this, into this, uh, into this enlightenment where this is your salvation, by the way. That's your salvation if you're an occultist. That's your salvation. It's through enlightenment. That's what it's all about. It's being, it's enlightenment. All right? So here's what they're going to do. Over there in Jerusalem, they're going to bring these religions together, and the Pope in Jerusalem is going to declare their God. Watch who he declares to be their God. Watch how he defines their God. God. Now let me make it simple to you this morning. All right? You don't have to mince words. My God is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's God manifest in the flesh. I have immediately offended a Jew. I have offended a Hindu. I have offended a Muslim. I've offended every religion on this earth. There's no way that we could ever come together as long as I say that the Lord Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. There's no other way to God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. As long as I say that, I can never be part of an ecumenical world religion. So watch this. Watch the wording. Words are important. Like Mark Twain said, he said there's a big difference between a lightning bug and lightning. <laughs> How many agree with that? <laughs> so you got to watch words. Watch the way they parse their words. When they come together in Jerusalem in a few days now, and they'll make some big, uh, big, big deal about it. And notice carefully the old city, the city that crucified our Lord. When they come together... I'm very interested now to see how they define their God. Amen. Aren't you? Amen. I, hope I've, I hope I've fired up a little, bit of, a little bit of interest in you to see what's coming now because you're going to get a preview of the new world religion's God. And I want to see who it, whatever it, what it, who he, whatever it is. I want to see it. And I'm uh, interested in it. All right. I meant to mention this at the beginning. Uh, I appreciate it if you'll hold till the end to ask your questions. And because uh, I want to try to keep my chain of thought, but we are at the end. So we're at a good time, Brother Rouye. What have you got? God's a generic term. It's generic, see? Generic in the sense that whatever you call God, okay, you call God, okay, this is God for you, this is God for you, fine. That's what that means. They sure are getting them ready. How many of you believe in here this morning, your heart of hearts now? I mean, just think about what I've, all this stuff I've said. How many people in here today really believe that the people are ready for the Antichrist? They're ready for the Antichrist on a number of levels. No, level number one, plain ignorance. They knew not till the flood came, took them all away. Level number two, you go into most of the church houses in this country, all you get is a bunch of New Age babble. That's all you get. That's all you get. You don't really see the Lord Jesus exalted like he should be exalted. You don't get it. And the reason you don't get it is because they don't know him. 
And then the third level, of course, is what's going on that's planned. And you see here this Pope Francis. Now let me say this in defense of some of the Catholics. I'm not going to defend the Catholic Church at all. But there are individual Catholics that are, that, that are doing the dead level best they can to live for the Lord. I don't question that. I don't question their motives. And their understanding of all this stuff about, about the Queen of Heaven. Uh, you know that Francis, along with many other popes, have called Mary the co-redemptrix. Co-redeemer. All right? That's blasphemy. That is pure blasphemy. She had no part in your redemption. But the reason they do that is to give her divinity. And by giving her divinity, they call her the mother of God. And when they call her the mother of God, that means that she predates God. Here we go. Queen of heaven, Sophia, here we go. The goddess that takes you back up here, okay? That's what you're getting here. When they start talking like that, that's what you're getting. Here's the problem. I believe that the average Catholic doesn't have a clue about any of that. They're just praying to rosaries and they're praying to Mary, Mother of God. They say these words, but they, have no, they don't really understand what's going on. So they, they like, probably like the biggest majority of the Baptists don't have a clue what's going on either. <laughs> you know, but uh, that's, that's my observation. How far I am from the truth, I'll leave that to the judge. But there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that the leadership are Luciferian. They know exactly who their God is. Amen. There's no doubt in my mind that when you rise to the top that they are worshipers of Lucifer and they, are, have, they have an agenda and, and the head of the Catholic Church and the head of the rest of them, they know where they're headed and they know what they're doing. Amen. They know that their God is not the Lord Jesus Christ. Their God is Lucifer. Amen. Their God is Lucifer. Just like Albert Pike said his God was Lucifer, they say their God is Lucifer. Amen. And here's the thing about worshiping Lucifer. He will accommodate himself to your culture, your time, your people, wherever you are. He will accommodate himself. He'll change his looks. He'll be whatever you want him to be just as long as you worship him as Lucifer. Amen. And that's the way it works. And that's the way it's going to work until the Lord Jesus shows up. Amen. And boy, when he does show up, everything's going to bust loose. Amen. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. See, that's a good point, brother. I've heard, I've heard real smart people bring that same point out, and nobody can answer it. Oh, absolutely. They want to keep them over there like that. See, that's a good question. Very good question. These Arab countries that are, that are floating in oil, they are, they are super rich, and yet they're not taking these refugees. Why? Why is it they're being forced into Western Europe and then ultimately America? Why is it that Hillary Rodham Clinton wants to bring in five times as many? She's already said that when she goes into office. I saw a sign on the side of a road uh, on the way in this morning out there at Halls. That big sign out there said Trump, and there's a little sign that said Hillary for prison. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. Where's all the women and the children? This is what you get sympathy with, you know, women and the children. And, uh, but no, it's not, it's not them. They just use that as a front. Yes, 75, 80% of them are young men. And they're the ones doing the raping and the killing, too. And that's exactly what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, uranium, you know what you can use it for. That's, yeah. Yes, sir. It's coming up. It's coming up in September. What did I give you the dates on? 11th? 11th through the 23rd. September the 11th through the 23rd. There's no telling what's liable to show up there, brother. It's when they feel like that they can pull, that they can, that they can show their hand and, and do their thing. Uh, 
and there may be, and I firmly believe this, working in conjunction with the spirit world, and the spirit world can bring out some manifestations that'll blow the mind of people. Revelation 13 had fire to call, had, had power to call fire down from heaven and stuff like that. And it's not the kind of thing that people that are up on technology could be fooled by. It's something that appears that just blows their mind. Supernatural power. So what I'm saying is, it could be that he that letteth will let till he be taken out of the way, and once he steps back and says, all right, now you can have it, and these spiritual powers begin to manifest themselves through these messengers that we're talking about here today, that's when the great deception begins to fall on the earth. And it's coming, and it's coming. Yes, sir. All right, we've got uh, about 15 till. We'll have a word of prayer, and we'll go. We'll meet again next Sunday morning. And we'll get, uh, we'll get a little further into this now. Well, our next step is this. What's the connection between Lucifer and Satan? Lucifer and Satan. Both names apply to the same being. Lucifer, Satan, and the devil. What is the connection? How does the occult world see Lucifer and Satan? That's important. It's important for us to understand because by showing how they see him, and how the Bible presents him, it tells you that the Bible is a source of authority and truth completely disconnected from the occult world. You see what I'm saying? Everything we believe about God and our Lord Jesus Christ is a direct revelation from God. We didn't get anything from the occult world because they see it completely different than we do. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. And uh, we'll deal with that next week. Uh, when we get into it. All right. Let's have a word of prayer. Brother Ron Widener, will you dismiss us, please?